So 684, Joel 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, a mighty army without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off the bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the betrothed of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the olive oil fails. Despair, you farmers, wail, you vine growers, grieve for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree, all the trees, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the people's joy is withered away. Put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God, for the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, some of the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Has not the food been cut off before our very eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seeds are shriveled beneath the clods. The storehouses are in ruins. The granaries have been broken down, for the grain has dried up. How the cattle moan. The herds mill about because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep are suffering. To you, Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness, and flames have burned up all the trees of the field. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness. So the second part is uh, Joel chapter 2, from t verse 12 to 17. So even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy feast, fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priest who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn. And by word among the nations, why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? This is the word of the Lord. Father God, in, in a week which has just gone with uh, the war in uh, Ukraine and the uncertainty it's a comfort to sing, as we did a moment ago, our God reigns. And that you are Emmanuel. You are with us. You are with your people. And so we pray, Lord, that and we didn't organize it like this, but I pray that this passage would be a comfort to us, a comfort to us in our uncertainty and in our fears. I pray, Father, that these same truths would be heard by believers in Ukraine and that they might find encouragement in your word today as they gather and Father, please, whether we're Christians or not, please speak to our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that we'll be found ready to meet you when we do. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know if you've um, watched the film Don't Look Up yet on Netflix. It's been nominated for various different uh, uh, Oscars, I think. Um, it's an all-star cast. It's very much worth seeing. It's about uh, two astrophysicists played by Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence. And they discover 
that there's a massive meteor heading towards Earth and it's going to wipe out all life on Earth in, in about six months' time, uh, I think it is. Now, if you're worried I've just spoiled the film for you, don't worry, because that all happens in basically the first three minutes. The film is really about how Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence, how they managed to persuade the world that this event is actually going to happen. As you can imagine, at first their message is met with real cynicism. People sort of dismissed it as, as, as fake news. But eventually the meteor becomes literally visible with the human eye. And so they, they go on YouTube, whatever it is, and they, and they call the world to look up. See for yourself. Disaster is coming. You've got to get ready. You've got to prepare. What's fascinating is that there's a political counter movement in the film, which says the exact opposite. That they say, no, 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 pretend the meteor's not coming. Pretend it's not there. Just carry on life as normal. Carry on your jobs as normal. Carry on consuming. Carry on voting. Don't look up. Don't look up. The film raises this big question. How should we respond to the prospect of disaster? How, how do we help people get ready for disaster? And it might be an international disaster, um, like climate change, which I think the, the, uh, the film is really a metaphor for. Or, or it might be war, as we're reading on newspapers today. Or it might be a global pandemic. It might be a massive, huge, huge global scale disaster like that. Or perhaps for you, it's a real personal disaster. Uh, a sudden unemployment, a sudden bereavement or a bad diagnosis. The prospect of death. How do we, how do we make sense of disaster? How do, how, how, do we, how, how do we approach that subject given its, its hugeness? Now, we're all temperamentally wired slightly differently, aren't we? And we, we all sort of respond slightly different ways. And we, we kind of saw that, didn't we, over, over the pandemic, how different people responded differently. And it's, so much comes down to our DNA and our upbringing and our temperament, all that sort of thing. Well, I wonder if you're an activist. Are you an activist? Are you someone who you like to think, well, if you just have all the right information and if you do the right things and make the right decisions, then with kind of breezy optimism, you, you kind of think you'll, you'll be immunized against having suffering in your life. Maybe, maybe that's you. You're an activist. Or maybe like me, you're a, a cynic. And I think I'm definitely falling into this category. We, we kind of use levity and dark humor to, to keep these serious, weighty issues away from my heart. I joke about the, the silly things, about these heavy things. I, I make bad news light in order to stop it really affecting me. Maybe that's you. You're a cynic. Or maybe, like in the film, maybe you simply refuse to look up. We never stop to think about why we're here, what life is for, how to make sense of tragedy. Maybe you just never stopped to look up and think. In my experience, there's people in that last category who um, fall into the deepest despair when tragedy does come, and it does come. Well, the prophet Joel, he wrote this little book to prepare his people for disaster. Not, not so much the disaster of a, of a locust plague or a drought, as terrible as those are, but the ultimate disaster of one day standing before your God and creator and being totally unprepared. That is the real disaster which Joel wants to prepare his people for. And you might have gathered from our readings, this isn't a light book. And, and I, I don't make an apology for that. My job is not to entertain you for the next 30 minutes. My job is to prepare you for the inevitable day when you will stand before your creator and judge. So whether you call yourself a Christian or, or maybe you're just here today as a guest looking in on Christian things, the book of Joel is for you. So here's the first thing Joel wants to persuade us of. We need to wake up. Now, he says, now is the time to wake up. So would you look down with me, page 684, 
And his poetry begins in verse two with this intergenerational summons for everyone to come and listen. Elders, gather the people who are under your care. Parents, get your children here. Grandparents, get your grandkids here. Everyone must gather. But why? Because they must not forget the events of verse four. Look down. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have let have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Now, when I was about 12 years old, um, I noticed all my friends had pets and I wanted a pet. So I was quite a weird child. So I decided to keep locusts. You can imagine little 12-year-old Andy keeping locusts in his bedroom. They're really noisy creatures. And I bought them from PetSave. And uh, they come as little hoppers, we saw in the video. But very quickly, in a matter of weeks, they turned into these enormous flying monsters who flew around this little vivarium I had, making the almighty noise. And eventually, I fed them to my snakes. Um, <laughs> I was a very, very weird child. But as David Attenborough educated us a few moments ago on planet Earth. In the right conditions, these solitary grasshoppers become an unstoppable, formidable army. And you may have noticed that David Attenborough's language all comes from Joel. Look at verse 6. A nation has invaded my land, a mighty army without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. See, David Attenborough, he zeroes in on the biology of it, doesn't he? Joel's interest, though, is in the sociology. He, he takes his cramped camera crew and, and he interviews various different peoples affected by this locust plague. And his first choice of subject in verse 5 is quite surprising. It's not who you'd guess. Verse 5, wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. Now again, you probably wouldn't guess that the, the nation's drunkards or wine connoisseurs, that they would be the first on, on Joel's sort of um, biography list. But, but they've been very carefully chosen. Because these group of people almost act as a metaphor for the spiritual state of God's people at this time. Now, you might not be interested in this, but there are big debates amongst theologians about when exactly the book of Joel happened. There's no time stamp. We're not given the name of any king at verse 1. So there's a bit of a debate going on. Some people think Joel prophesied before the exile, before they went to Babylon. But increasingly, the majority opinion now is that Joel spoke after the exile, after the return back from Babylon. And that's my own view. And one of the reasons is because the big spiritual issue in Joel isn't the worship of foreign gods or false gods like Baal or, or Ashtoreth or, or Molech. That, that's sort of the pre-exile prophet's concerns. No, the, the concern in Joel is the far more subtle idolatry of wealth and ease the problem is that whilst God's people had returned home back to Jerusalem, back to the promised land, they hadn't really returned to the Lord in their hearts. Upon arriving back, they kind of began work rebuilding uh, God's temple, the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. But after a series of setbacks and disappointments, they just gave up on that. And they, they began living for themselves. They, they began just focusing on building and renovating their own houses, uh, on the, focusing on their own comfort, attending to their own vineyards, their, their own wine collection, their own leisure. You see the issue. Well, this locust plague put an end to all of that. This prosperous ease to which God's people had, had almost become wedded. Well, well that's dead now. And so in verse 8, if you look down, the people are called to mourn like a bride on her wedding day because her husband is dead. The thing which they live for and worship, their prosperous ease is, is dead. Their wedding is ruined. The future looks perilous. 
I, this is by way of aside, this is one of the things which struck me as I reflected this week on, on how we as a nation responded to the COVID pandemic. I guess it's been, it's a little bit behind us now, I guess, but certainly there was this huge concern, wasn't there, to, uh, for the vulnerable people who were at risk. And I know a number here lost parents or grandparents um, to, to that disease. But I don't know if it's just me, but I wonder if actually most of the outrage was almost reserved for the fact that we've been robbed of our usual comforts. Our social lives have been disrupted. Our holidays ruined. Our parties cancelled. Our life plans put on hold. I wonder if that reveals something of where our culture's heart, what what it's really wedded to. Maybe that was a wake-up call for us. Well, it's only in verse 11 that Joel's camera crew reaches the farmers on Israel's uh, staple crops. So look at down verse 11. Despair, you farmers. Wail, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up. The fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm, the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the people's joy is withered away. So the poetry here describes complete and utter agricultural failure. It's not just the vine, the wine, which is being disrupted. Now all the crops, every single crop which will be harvested at different points of the year, every single one of them fails. Whatever it was that the young locusts didn't eat, the older, the adult locusts ate, and then along comes a drought to finish off literally every other piece of food. No wonder the people are despairing. But you may have noticed, as, as Guy read a moment ago, the same phrase keeps on coming back in, back in. Dried up. Dried up. Dried up. Everything in the land that was once so green and full of life is is now withered and dead. And that's because the nation's worship was located in in the wrong place. Now, we need to be careful here because we are not Israel. They're under a special covenant or deal with God, if you put it like that. Um, If they obeyed God and worshipped him, they would receive prosperity and fertility in their land. If they disobeyed God, they would receive curse. And and these locusts and this drought was a picture of that that covenant curse because they were worshipping other things. Um, But we're we're not Israel, obviously. Um, We're not them. But, But there's a general sense in which that same principle applies. For us, there's no causal relationship between our sin and how well we do at work, for example, or how prosperous our land is, the fertility of our fields. But there is a general principle which we can apply. You might know at the very beginning of the Bible, we we read of mankind's sin against God, rebellion against God. And at that point, God placed all of creation under, under a curse. In other words, the reason our world is so broken and messed up is because we are so broken and messed up. Now there's this inevitability about disease and death. There's a futility to our work. So if you wait long enough, pretty much everything in life, will one day, to use Joel's phrase, dry up and wither. Now think about this for yourself. I guess this is why it's so stupid, so foolish. For, for us to take good things in creation, good things like wine, you know, like um, home ownership, like, like success and status and things like that, it's why it's so stupid to take good things from God and then worship them as though they are God. To make these things the center and epicenter of our life and make them our purpose and make them our, 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 our aim and, and, our, and our identity. See, these things were never designed to be worshipped. And one day, what will happen to them? They will wither. They will dry up. 
I, I don't know what it is that you're inclined to worship in, instead of God. Just think about it. No matter how much you, you work you put into looking good and keeping healthy, no matter how great your Instagram filters, one day your beauty will fade. And no matter how hard you work, no matter how industrious you are, one day your career will end. And no matter how much people look up to you and respect you now, one day people won't even remember your name. I don't even know the name of my great-grandfather. I doubt any of us here do. It's interesting, this Hebrew word for dried up, it's the same word for shame. And, and I guess that's because that's where worshipping the wrong thing leads. It leads to shame because you spend your whole life putting all your energy and your focus into worshipping, making these things so important, and, and then they fail. They wither. And then what have you got? Well, in verse 13, Joel's camera crew finally reaches Israel's leaders at this time. There wasn't a king, but instead it was the temple priesthood. Verse 13. Put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God, for the grain offerings and the drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. So he called it Joel, that the crowning tragedy of this vast locust plague was that temple worship was disrupted. The daily grain and, and drink offerings in the temple were, were like a, a means of communion with God, a way of expressing their enjoyment of God. But, but now, of course, there could be no communion because there was no vine, there was no grain. So what does God call his priests to do? Did he say, oh, just carry on the pretense, just carry on doing the same old pantomime, pretend everything's great between me and the people? No. No, God wants the priests to lead his people in repentance, to put on sackcloth and ashes above everything else. That was to be their priority. And again, by way of aside, this principle still applies to Christian leaders today. It's tragedy, isn't it, when you get the sense from the leaders of a church that, that you are the people who need to repent. Oh, oh, not me. I'm on a different era. I'm on a different hierarchy. I'm on a different pedestal. Now, God's leaders are to lead God's people in repentance. That's always been the case. So Joel, by giving us these three different snapshots of life within Israel, that the drunks, the farmers, the priests, we're supposed to see just how this locust has managed to devastate everyone's lives. Completely and discriminately. It didn't matter who you are. It didn't matter what your status or your profession or your rank within society. The locusts got to you. And so it is with suffering. You can't ever immunize yourself from it entirely, can you? In fact, my experience is it's, it's the wealthy who often are caught most off guard by it. Uh, because we've been raised with this, this uh, perhaps this expectation that life will only ever be great. And so when life isn't great, we fall apart because it's never been a part of our life narrative. I, I find it interesting to compare what the Bible says about suffering and how we're to deal with it with, with other cultures. You might know in ancient Near East, there's a bunch of other pantheons of gods. And, and some, of, some people believe that the gods were, were nasty. They're capricious bastards really and so you can cry out to gods to the gods but they don't care they don't care about you they don't love you so there's no point crying out to them other people groups they believe the gods were just distant and 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 they didn't really have any power so you can cry out to them but they couldn't really do anything what we read in the in the, in the hebrew scriptures what we read in the bible is god's people holding these two truths god is all-powerful and he is very good. He is good. And so it's natural then for God's people to, to cry out to him because they believe he is, 
their father in heaven. They believe he's, he's good and he's powerful. And this is the basis of Joel's appeal throughout the whole book. But let's just look at verse 19. To you, Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness. Flames have burned up all of the trees of the field. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up. Fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness. It is interesting, isn't it? That even people who wouldn't describe themselves as religious in any way, that when tragedy comes, their instinct is to look up. It might be look up in anger and blame God. It might be to look up in, in, in pleading help. As a, as a poll back in 2018, uh, polling atheists, do you know 25% of British atheists pray? That seems odd, doesn't it? No, not really. If even creation, if even the, the, uh, the, uh, the wild animals pant for God in this crisis, well, shouldn't we? So I guess the big question is this. If, if God is simultaneously good and all-powerful, why is he letting his people suffer like this? That's probably the question you would be thinking all along. Before we get to that, just, just think, about, think about this. It is a comfort to know that there is a God who exists, who is all good and who is all powerful. Because there, if there is no God, your suffering is totally meaningless. The world wars are totally pointless. There's no purpose. There's no design. It's all completely random and there's no rhyme nor reason to it. That is of no comfort whatsoever. But we believe God is good and he is powerful. And so when we suffer, when disaster comes, it's not blind or random or meaningless. There is a purpose behind it. And for this locust plague, we see what the purpose is in verse 15. Look down. Alas, for that day of the locust. For the day of the Lord is near. It will come like the destruction from the Almighty. If you've ever been to the cinema, you know, before you see the main tra feature film, you always get a bunch of trailers, don't you? Telling you, come and see this film, come and see this film. If you like, the locust is the trailer to a far more terrible feature-length production. And God is showing his people this trailer, pleading with them, don't go see the feature film. The day of the locust is there to prepare his people for the day of the Lord. And that's why we need this book, to prepare us for the day when we, when you and I, will stand before our creator God. That is the purpose behind our suffering, behind disasters, behind wars and epidemics and tragedies. To lead us to him, to prepare us to meet him. I'm sure you've heard of C.S. Lewis. He um, wrote the, the Narnia children's books, but actually he's an Oxford philosopher. His wife died tragically of, of cancer in 1960. And shortly afterwards, he wrote a book called The Problem of Pain. And, and, and he, he wrote this in it, a very famous quote. He wrote, pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our consciences. But shouts in our pains. Suffering is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I wonder if a bit like the drunk back in verse 5, some of us just need to wake up. Wake up and, and start listening. There's a pastor in America called John Piper who wrote a book called Don't Waste Your Cancer. Having suffered cancer himself, he was pleading with people, don't waste your cancer. Why do I have cancer? To lead me to God. We can equally ask, well, don't say, don't, don't, waste, don't waste your pandemic. Don't waste your war. Don't waste your bereavement. Don't waste that bad diagnosis. Don't waste your un sudden unemployment. 
tragedy happens to make you question the things you're originally living for. And then seek your God before it's too late. So now is the time to wake up. Because the day of the Lord is coming. I'm aware of time and for the sake of time, we're not going to look in chapter two in much detail, but it, it, it contains some of the most arresting poetry in the whole book. I'm not going to analyze it or go through it, but what I just my idea is just to read it. And you get a sense in this poetry of just the power of what is to come. He's, he's speaking about a, a future cosmic event, but, but taking the metaphor of the locust invasion to speak about what this future time will be like. Would you follow with me? Chapter 2, verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was in ancient times, nor will ever be in ages to come. Before them fire devours, behind them a blaze flames. Before them the land is like the Garden of Eden, behind them a desert waste. Nothing escapes them. They have the appearance of horses, they gallop along like cavalry. With a noise that, like that of chariots, they leap over the mountaintops like a crackling fire, consuming stubble, like a mighty army drawn up for battle. At the sight of them, nations are in anguish. Every face turns pale. They charge like warriors. They scale walls like soldiers. They march in line, not swerving from their course. They do not jostle each other. Each marches straight ahead. They plunge through defences without breaking ranks. They rush upon the city. They run along the wall. They climb into the houses like thieves. They enter through windows. Before them, the earth shakes. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number. And mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? See how the, the lengths, the pains which Joel is at to express just how unstoppable this army is. Their discipline in battle is unparalleled. Their war machines are far too advanced. No city walls can hold them at bay. That No houses or no matter wealth can, can keep them out. And their purpose is to bring death and chaos. Now a great deal of ink has been spilt working out what exactly the event is which is being described here. I think it's fairly obvious that the New Testament tells us what the day of the Lord is. It's the day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. That is the last day, if you like. But leading up to that last day is, is what the Bible calls a period called the last days. And in the book of Revelation, which is a, a, a book full of very strange dream language, uh, in chapter 9, you can go look at it later, the Apostle John takes all of this imagery from Joel 2 to describe what life will be like in the last days, leaving up to the last day. He, he, he describes how, in metaphorical language, a plague of locust-like creatures. But these aren't literal locusts which eat vegetation. In his dream, in his vision, that they're demonic locusts, which instead bring a different sort of torment. They bring a spiritual famine and spiritual turmoil to the world. That's a very weird chapter. And for that reason, we didn't have it read because I knew too many cans of worms. But if you're able to get past the weird imagery of it, I think it pretty much describes exactly where our culture's at. Spiritually barren. Well, not really knowing anything about God, little sense of God or hope 
or purpose or meaning or identity. And so we face a global pandemic and we're like, what do we do? Or, or we read about war or rumors of war. No one knows what to do. But the surprise in Revelation 9 and in Joel chapter 2 is that it's the sovereign God who deliberately allows this spiritual famine to occur. We can't just blame Satan, although he does have a role, of course. This is the Lord's army. Nothing can stop it. This is the Lord's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And he, he shouts at us in our pains. Because without him, life would be completely unbearable. Living life without making you able to make any sense of suffering or loss or tragedy. That is agony. My prayer is that all of us here would be would see this before it's too late. You might never have thought about this because you're quite young, but one day you will die. It's inevitable. One day you will meet your creator. And on that day, what are you going to be looking at to save you? Your flourishing career? It's withered. It's dried up. Your Instagram beauty? It's withered. It's dried up. Your brilliant holidays? Withered. Dried up. Your house? It's in ashes. Verse 11 asks us, it asks you, who can endure it? And the answer is, left to our own devices, no one. No one can. But there is some good news. And I decided not to close the sermon there. And instead, if you bear with me to push on, because I want to I share with you some means of hope in Joel. So imagine that the imagery again. There is this Lord's army, this vast, unstoppable army heading towards the city. And just before the final attack, the Lord God now speaks for the very first time in the book. What does the Lord say? Look at verse 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. So here's the captain of the Lord's army saying, there is a place to be safe and it's, it's with me. Return to me. Now is the time to repent. I'm aware that repent is such a loaded phrase, isn't it? We often picture people with a sandwich board outside a tube station going, repent, the Lord, you know, the Lord's coming. And it, it sounds quite weird, but the word repent simply means return. God's people had returned back to the land, but they hadn't returned to God. The Lord wants us to return to him. Not just turn away from living for the wrong things, but turn actively to him. Two errors we could fall into, which God warns us about, and particularly the danger for us unemotional British people, is, is for us to simply just academically assent, assent to God's existence. Yes, you exist. Yes, the things I've been living for are wrong. I shouldn't have done that. And it's just a mere academic thing. But God doesn't want that. He wants our hearts to return to me with all your heart. He wants you. And so the purpose of, of fasting, as we're doing this week, and, and weeping and, and mourning, it's to engage our emotions. Return to the Lord should be an emotional thing. But he goes on. There's another error that we could fall into. Verse 13, God says, rend your heart not your garments. So I guess this is the opposite error of, of just doing mere outward shows of repentance. We could walk around this week telling everyone, yes, I'm doing a media fast this week. Look at me. I was, I was, I was once at a, a, a college which was full of um, really high Anglo-Catholic tradition. and People love going around with ashes on their heads during Ash Wednesday to show everyone, look, look at, look at me. I am I'm, I'm being very, very remorseful of my sin. It's just an outward show. Because these people didn't know Jesus or love God. That's the other danger. 
But in both these verses, 12 and 13, the focus is on our hearts. That's what God wants. He wants you. But hang on, you're thinking, why, why would I return to God? He sounds, frankly, terrifying. And if you're first time you've ever been to CCB, and this is the first sermon perhaps you've ever heard, this is a weird talk. I get that. This is a frankly terrifying passage. Come back next week. He said, why would I want to return to, to, to this God? Well, almost to anticipate that very question. In verse 13, Joel reminds us who exactly the God is we're returning to. Fear is a terrible motivation. Love is a better one. Verse 13, he says, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. He relents from sending calamity. This description is taken from a time when God's people just been redeemed out of slavery in Egypt. God is meeting with Moses up on the mountain, revealing his character to him. All the while down below, what are God's people doing? Making a whopping great golden calf to bow down to. And it's at that moment, the very lowest point, when people's idolatry is caught out, that God says, this is what I'm like. Gracious. Abounding in love. Slow to anger. You might have the impression that God walks around with a fist held high, just waiting for someone to lamp. Yeah, he did wrong. No. God walks around with his arms open wide, just waiting for sinners to come back to him, that he might embrace them. Gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. So Joel asks, doesn't he, in verse 14, who knows, he may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Do you see, Joel's desire is for God people to enjoy him, to again, for there to be those offerings which allow communion with God, enjoyment of him. And, but he didn't know if there'll be any success if they do repent. Like, hey, everyone, let's repent, but who knows? It might work, it might not. He didn't have the whole story. Friends, I have very good news for you. We have the whole story. It was some 500, 600 years later that God himself decided to walk this earth. The Lord Jesus Christ embodied, enfleshed, incarnated the very characteristics we read in verse 13. Gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, bounding in love. He is, the, he is the bridegroom, the one for whom we were supposed to be and designed to be wedded to. He is the one for whom we are made. And he was sent by our father to come down and be our great high priest to make sacrifice for our sins. And do you know what? That's exactly what he did. He didn't just lead the perfect life. He then deliberately, willingly went to Golgotha, went to the cross, and there in the gloom and in the darkness, all of God's wrath, all of God's curse, all of God's anger poured down onto him so that we might be forgiven. He didn't do that just to return us back to this neutral state with God. He did it so that, verse 14, we might be blessed. The end goal of our salvation isn't our salvation. It's in order that we might enjoy God and he enjoy us. So that film, Don't Look Up. Again, I'm going to spoil the ending, sorry. It ends on a surprisingly religious theme. For a Hollywood movie, it ends weirdly. As the world braces for the end of life, as this meteor is crashing into the, to the, to the planet, Leonardo DiCaprio's character returns to his home in, in Michigan. He's been unfaithful throughout all of the film. And yet he returns home and he repents. He apologizes to his wife. And remarkably, she embraces him and, and welcomes him. And they reconcile. And, and then the characters gather around this table. And um, they have one last meal together, communion meal, if you like. And, and one of them comments with this meteor about to hit them. I, I guess we should pray. 
But no one really knows how to pray. Anyone here religious? No, no, no. One of them is. One of them was raised in an evangelical church like this. And he said, I I know how to pray. And this character prays this prayer. Dearest Father and almighty creator, we ask for your grace tonight, despite our pride. We ask for your forgiveness despite our doubt. Most of all, Lord, we ask for your love to soothe us soothe us through these dark times. May we face whatever is to come in your divine will with courage and open hearts of acceptance. Amen. So what do we do with Joel? Three things. Brothers and sisters, we need to wake up. Don't waste your suffering. Wake up. Now is the time to wake up. Secondly, now is the day to repent, to return to your gracious and compassionate God. And in a moment's time, I'm going to pray a prayer, prayer which will allow you to do that, even if for the first time. Do it now. It's never too late. But the third thing for us, those who know God already, those who are prepared, Will you do like Joel in chapter 2 and verse 1? Blow a trumpet and prepare those around you who aren't prepared. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, forgive me for worshipping created things rather than you my creator. I confess that these things will not satisfy, will never satisfy, but will only lead to shame and despair. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to take the anger which I deserve in my place. Thank you that you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, And I'll return to you now. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.